Welcome to CT Small Business Toolkit, where small business innovators and influencers share the advice that will help you turn your idea into a business and your business into a success. Let's get started. Our guest this week on CT Small Business Toolkit is Jim McCarthy. He is the CEO of Gold Star. That, as you well know, is a website and app that helps people discover and purchase tickets to live events. He founded the company in 2002, and it's recently hit nearly 30 cities nationwide and hit more than 6 million members. So he joins me now to share a little bit of the story of his entrepreneurial journey, particularly with Gold Star, and uh, some of the entrepreneurial lessons also that he's learned along the way. And Jim, thanks very much for being with us. Greg, thank you for having me. Uh, Tell our listeners briefly about where you started as an entrepreneur and how it eventually led you to launch Gold Star. I started Gold Star with two very good friends who are still involved in the business every single day, Rich Webster and Robert Graff. And we, at one point in our lives and careers, were driving about an hour to an hour and a half each way to a job at a startup together. We had two very long car rides every single day to a a different job together in which we talked about the day that would one day come that we started our own our own shop, our own way of doing things. And so after a couple of years of doing that, and I think at the right time in our careers, we actually did it. We started Gold Star and uh, started planning it in 2001 and launched in, in early 2002. So part of it was the encouragement of uh, good friends who, you know, we share a lot of values and, and outlooks on business, but also we have very different skills. And we, and we all thought, you know, one of these days we're going to do it our own way and be our own bosses and, and build a business. And that, in, in many ways, that was really the, uh, the origin of Gold Star. Now, back in, in 2002, it might be hard for some folks to remember, yeah. uh, mobile technology was not quite what it is now. Most people uh, didn't have, uh, they, most, a lot of people had cell phones then, the smartphone yeah. didn't quite exist yet. So what could you do then? And uh, how did that evolve over the years? It was all website based at the time, email and web based, and uh, you know, so there was a lot of capability that, in in our view, wasn't being taken advantage of in the live entertainment ticketing business in terms of matching people and events or matching people and potential tickets that they might be interested in buying. Traditionally, the you know mass customization that you can do with email and a database wasn't really being employed in live entertainment. So you had 40 to 50 percent of tickets in live entertainment being unsold. And, and you know, I could ask you this question, I guess, and we could find out, but almost everybody asks this question. If I ask them, do you go out to as many things as you'd like to go out to, they almost always say no. So I, I don't know, Greg, how about you? Do you, do you go out to uh, music and theater and comedy and sports as often as you'd like? No. See, there you go. So <laughs> you've, got, <laughs> you've got an industry full of, of uh, you know, producers of entertainment that would love to have you there, and you have millions and millions of people out there who are, are maybe sitting at home or playing Candy Crush on their iPad or something that really would rather be doing something more fun. So we felt even back then that the network technology represented at that point by email and by uh, website could match up, in a sense, those upcoming opportunities to go to an event with people that would be interested in being there. And so e- even though the technology has changed a lot, the concept of how to uh, you know, kind of create that marketplace of live entertainment that brings people together with shows that want to have more people come to them is the same. Two questions, which might uh, be trade secrets, but uh, first of all, how do you match up people with interest? How do you figure out what they're most likely to be interested in attending? One of the the most direct ways of doing that is by, you know, using the sort of typical collaborative filter software that somebody like an Amazon uses. And there are open source versions of this software that if you have a reasonably good, you know, development shop in, in, inside your business, you can implement. Uh, we had to modify it in a bunch of ways. If you think about it, um, the collaborative filter that makes recommendations on, on an Amazon or a Netflix, that kind of thing, uses the predictive power of what other people have done and what you've done to, to find places where there's a pattern match, right? But with live entertainment, it's uh, somewhat more complicated because there's also the issue of where the show is. At that, at that time, it would be great for us to recommend, uh, you know, a show that to somebody who's in L.A., but if the show's in Chicago, Chicago, it's not very helpful to them, right? Um, and then also shows end, unlike books. You know, if, you, if Amazon's recommending a book to you, that book is basically the same worldwide at any time. So we had to make a, a number of modifications to make that happen. 
So there's the high-tech part of it, and then there's what I would consider more the merchandising part of it, where over time we came to understand what kinds of events are more appealing to people in different markets and different people who've indicated different interests, for example. And gradually, I think what we've done is we've been able to tune the the inventory that we both uh, make available and promote uh, to what people want. Then the other question, uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of times people can get tickets through Gold Star at a greatly reduced price. How do you pull that off? There's obviously other sites out there where you can find tickets to events, but usually it's the person's wanting face value or, or, or something close to it, unless it's really close to the event and they just want to get something for an event they can't get to. But uh, how do you do this routinely? Well, we have highly incriminating information about most <laughs> of the marketers of live entertainment around. I'm just kidding. We don't have any incriminating information on anybody. But what we do have is we have relationships with almost 5,000 venues and producers of live entertainment around the country. And we have a staff of about 35 people at Gold Star that on a day-to-day basis work with uh, those venues to let them know that there are lots and lots of ways to reach our 6 million live entertainment customers and we want to help them make a lot of sales, get a lot of people into those venues. So by virtue of having those relationships, those one-on-one relationships, which by the way, took a long time to build and took a lot of effort and, and sweat to figure out how to make sure we're delivering value for those venues. Um, with, you know, that, that makes the difference between being able to have a special selection of inventory, including the discounts that you talked about, and, and being just like everybody else with the, the broker inventory that you can get anywhere, typically, as you said, at face value or higher. We're talking with Jim McCarthy. He's the founder and CEO of Gold Star. And, Jim, we began our conversation talking about the technology that existed at the time. And, and, and Gold Star began as an email and online business. And, obviously, technology has advanced. What has been the exciting part? What's been the challenging part about trying to keep up with all the advancements over the last 13 years? And now Gold Star is primarily a, a mobile business. We, we do about 70% of our usage is on uh, mobile, whether smartphone or, or tablet, uh, and almost half of our sales, somewhere between 40 and 50% of our sales are on mobile. And that transition's happened actually over the last two or three years very rapidly. It wasn't a, a kind of a straight line from, you know, 2002 up to, you know, 2015. It's very much of a, an inflection point that we hit. Um, Oh, which which iPhone was it in tw- that came out in 2012? There was one version of the iPhone that really broke it open. I think for not just us, but for everybody. But we we start we started investing very heavily in 2012, and I think we did that at just the right time uh, because it, it it coincided with I think it might have been the iPhone 4 um, or the the 3S or 3G or whatever it was. But but uh, it was really uh, a huge huge inflection point at that point because. As you said, in 2002, the idea of commerce on a phone was was pretty much untenable, but I would say that it wasn't really uh, something that most people participated in as a consumer until about 2011 or 2012. The frustrating thing for us was that there were a lot of years where we were making investments in mobile that weren't paying off. We happened to invest, I think, at the right time in, in 2011, 2012 being the beginning of it, at a point where the technology really made it viable. And so... It was a question of doing a version of the website that originally a mobile version of the website that was actually every bit as good or at least getting closer and closer every day to being every bit as good as the desktop site and going through a couple of iterations on the app to get to the point where we are today where, you know, the app and the smartphone web experience are the the default way that people use Gold Star as opposed to desktop. The big change for us was that at some point, we had to flip that mindset around, and that's harder than you think, you know, because if you've been doing business for eight or nine years or whatever it was, you are used to, you know, the website being the place where everything happens, and you have to change that mindset and, and um, you know, begin to invest the other way. At this point, we've, we've kind of made that transition, but, you know, there, there's a lot. And as, as a leader of a company, as somebody who's directing people's thoughts about the subject and direct the investment of time and money in the company, you have to make sure that you, you get people over that hump of, of thinking, you know, th- this is very real. We have, to, we have to make this as good as anything, better than, better than, you know, the desktop experience. 
Jim, last question. Uh, obviously, some of our listeners might be in fields related to the, the things we've been talking about with Gold Star. Others might just be interested in, in some of the lessons you've learned, good or bad, tough or easy lessons you've learned along the way in terms of starting or running your business. Uh, what sticks yeah. out most in your mind about things that you look back and say, man, we really did that well, or man, I wish we would have done that differently? Well, we were talking about keeping up with technology, and I, and I think that you know one area where we did it right um, was was in in the mobile area because I, I think what's very important and the advice that I would give people when it comes to technology and its you know its evolution over time, which is inevitable, is you need to decide where where in the world of technology you're going to lead, where you're going to be a fast follower, and where you might even be willing to trail. In 2008, there was a lot of pressure on, uh, or not, not pressure, but there was a lot of talk about, hey, it's all about mobile and getting commerce on mobile. But lots of people spent millions and millions of dollars on e-commerce implementations for BlackBerry and for other platforms that really didn't make any sense. I think when when you're starting a business in particular, you don't really have your sea legs under you yet. You're going to get a lot of advice potentially from people saying, oh, you got to be in this field, or you got to you got to be doing this thing. When in fact, what you need to know is precisely why and what the benefits of that would be, as opposed to feeling like you got to be there because everyone's saying you got to be there. I think it's perfectly acceptable to be a fast follower, or even to trail on certain technologies if they're not important. You know, one example that I think of there is that, you know, we we have our infrastructure both in the cloud and still in a physical location. And, you know, where it's made sense, we've we've moved it over to uh to the cloud, but we still save a lot of money and get a lot of efficiency out of having a physical infrastructure in these days that, you know, that's kind of the opposite of what, you know, people are told. So it's the cloud is cheaper. Well, it is sometimes and sometimes it's not. So I think those those kinds of things um, you know, from my point of view, I would say you you have to be uh, aware of why you're either adopting or or not adopting a technology, and it's perfectly fine to make a decision that says, well, you know, we're going to be a, a, a real leader in this particular area, but if we spent the kind of time and resources to be a real leader in this other area, it might not make any difference to the business, so why do that? Okay. I think that's very important for an entrepreneur uh, because it's all about taking what's typically a very limited amount of, of time and effort and, and money and applying it in the places where it really makes a difference. Jim, thank you so much for sharing your story with us uh, and, and the lessons you've learned along the way. Best wishes to you going forward. Thanks very much. Jim McCarthy is the founder and CEO at Gold Star. For more information, goldstar.com. I'm Greg Corumbus reporting for CT Small Business Toolkit. Thanks for joining us on CT Small Business Toolkit. Be sure to visit our website, ct.walterskluwer.com, and follow at CT Corporation on Twitter. We'll see you next time on CT Small Business Toolkit.